Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back. We're going to be digging into the second part of Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7, we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 27, and we're going to finish this book of Ezekiel chapter 7 this morning, amen. So if you would, turn with me to Ezekiel 7, we're going to start in verse 19. It says, they will throw their silver into the streets and their gold will be like refuse. Their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They will not satisfy their souls nor fill their stomachs because it became their stumbling block of inequity. As for the beauty of his ornaments, he set it in majesty, but they made from it images of their abominations. their detestable things, therefore I have made it like refuse to them. I will give it as plunder unto the hands of strangers and to the wicked of the earth as spoil, and they shall defile it. I will turn my face from them, and they will defile my secret place, where robbers shall enter it and defile it. Make a chain for the land is filled with crimes of blood and the city is full of violence. Therefore, I will bring the worst of the Gentiles and they will possess their houses. I will cause the pomp of the strong to cease and their holy places shall be defiled. Destruction comes. They will seek peace, but there shall be none. Disaster will come upon disaster and rumor will be upon rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. The king will mourn. The prince will be clothed with desolation and the hands of the common people will tremble. I will do to them according to their way and according to what they deserve. I will judge them and they shall know that I am the Lord. The word of the Lord this morning. Amen. Throughout mankind's existence, there's been the sinful desire to become rich. Money has, the love of money has become prominent in the world. Look at the various types of disasters that we face today. We, we face hurricanes, we face tornadoes, we face fires, we face floods and earthquakes and terrorist attacks. When these occur, I want you to see something this morning. When these disasters occur, money has no value whatsoever. Money can't save you from a hurricane. Money can't save you from a tornado. Money can't save you from fire. Money can't save you from floods. Money can't save you from earthquakes. Money can't save you from terrorist, terrorist attacks. You can have all the money that you want. But if there isn't any food or water available, what good is it when you are stuck just like everyone else? Like us, the Israelites had allowed their love of money to corrupt them. This is just another category of idolatry. First Timothy says in, in verse 10, it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We, we've learned a valuable lesson from Jesus when he described the sinful nature as listed in the gospel of Luke chapter 12, 
15 through 21. He says, and he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those will those things be which you have provided. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The more I dwell on this fact, the more I see the depravity of man. The more that I dwell on this fact, the more that I see that the depravity of man, that our depravity, our God has allowed us the wisdom to use money for good purposes. And it's one of his abundant amounts of gifts showered on us. So knowing this, what do we do with our money? We use it to buy things that separate us from the very God who loves us and was the giver of these gifts. I don't know about you, but that really hits me in the deepest of my core that we use the gift that God has given us to provide for us. And what we use this money for actually drives us away from God instead of into the presence of God. And that should hit you in your core this morning. We wind up spending so much time and energy trying to find satisfaction for ourselves instead of seeking the one who is the source of satisfaction. Look at verse 20 through 22. It says, as for the beauty of his ornaments, he set it in majesty, but they made from it the images of their abominations. They're detestable things, therefore I have made it like ref refuse to them. I will give it as plunder into the hands of strangers and to the wicked of the earth as spoil, and they shall defile it. I will turn my face from them, and they will defile my secret place, for robbers shall enter it and defile it. Our Lord loved his city and the temple dedicated to him. We read in the book of 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, our Lord's answer to King Solomon after the temple was dedicated. And it says, and it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time. And as he appeared to him at Gibeon, and the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house, which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, if you walk before me as your father, David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you. And if you keep my statues and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David, your father saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me. Now, I want you to take very close attention to this. Because you have to pay very close attention to this. God is saying. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes where I have set before you. But go and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them. And this house, which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and byword among all people. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Then they will answer because they forsook the Lord, their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them before the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. You see, God gave his people silver and gold to use to worship him. 
They took the gold that was dedicated to him out of the temple treasury and did two horrible deeds. One, they stole from God. And two, they used the precious metals to make idols. A few verses that we do not like to look at is from the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. It says, will a man rob God? See, a lot of people use this, a lot of pastors use this today about tithing. When you're in the church, they say, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. This isn't talking about tithing. This isn't to make you feel guilty about giving. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will be no room enough to receive it. You see, the Lord God Almighty is abundant in mercy and grace. He gave to the people silver and gold. And instead of the riches, instead of using these riches to honor him in their lives, the people use the precious metals to dishonor him by making useless idols. We can learn from this evil a little something about ourselves this morning. If we use God's resources or abuse his gifts, we also miss the real purpose of his original intention for entrusting us his goods in the first place. If we continually do not serve as his good stewards of his treasures, guess what? He's going to stop giving them to you. If you're not a good steward of what he's already given you, you're not going to receive any more. He's going to stop giving them to you. Well, Pastor Nate, I don't see anything that the Lord's giving me. Have you looked at your house? Have you looked at your job? Have you looked at your income? Have you looked at the car that you drive, the bicycle you ride? Have you looked at the food in your fridge? Have you looked at your family that you're around? Have you looked at the things that God has provided for you? Because when he stops giving them to you, we lose our jobs. We lose our income. We lose our car. We lose a family member. We lose something in our life because we were not good stewards over what he's already given. If you're now going through trying experiences, which I've just described, I suggest this as 1 John 1, 9 recommends. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repent of your sins. Ask God to give you another chance. This is the way to turn back to our holy and wonderful great God. But he says in the text we read this morning, and I will give them into the hands of strangers. I will give them into the hands of strangers. Wait a minute, Lord. I'm your child. You promised to take care of me. What's this about? Issuing blessings that should be given to me to others. Why are you taking my blessings and giving them to others? You see, there was a prophet of God by the name of Habakkuk who had the same issues as I just mentioned in his book from chapter 1, 1 through 2, 9. We see his concerns and questions as is well worth us reviewing this morning. I believe we really need to look at this because I want you to see exactly what happens. It says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what the will what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. 
because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man and he does not stay at home because he enlarges himself, his desires as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, woe to him who increases what is not his? How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will not they awaken who oppress you and you will become their booty? Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence in the land and in the city and of all who dwell in it. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. The Lord tells his prophet that because of the evil of his people, he will shock them by using more evil than them to destroy them all. This at first seems wrong, doesn't it? This seems wrong that God's going to use anger and discipline to punish them. But it is the correct discipline issued from a perfect, just, and holy God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13, this, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. That he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you for I indeed as absent in body but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present whom him who has done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when you are gathered together along with my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Do you not know this morning that a little bit of your sin spoils all your toil? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Since you are truly unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you. He's writing to you right now. He said, I'm now writing to you. Not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, covetous, or an idolater, or a viler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. Be careful who you're surrounding yourself with. Be careful who your faith five is. Be careful of the crowd that you're in. Be careful of the fire that you're warming up at. Be careful of those that are around you because their traits, their characteristics begin to pull onto you they begin to fall onto you you begin to act like them you begin to speak like them you begin to hear like them you begin to touch like them you begin to act just as they are he says that you're not even to eat with such a person for what have i to do with judging those also who are outside do you not judge those who are inside but those who are outside god judges Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Now, you might be asking this morning, Pastor, why are you reading 1 Corinthians if we're in Ezekiel 7? And I share this scripture for a reason. I shared this for a reason. 
Because God says that he constantly watches over us to keep us on the right track. When we sin, when we veer off that correct path, so in love he wakes us up by chastening us to stop sinning. When his own do not respond to his discipline and continue to go deeper and deeper into a sinful lifestyle, he says to us, let that brother or sister go for the full gusto of their sinful pursuits in hopes that they will see and experience the results of that pursuit. Our Father uses people who are more evil and have been more deeper into their sins to show us what our future would be like. Oh, somebody better come on this morning. God is going to allow people to come into your life so that you can see what your life is going to be if you do not stay on the righteous path. He's going to allow you to see exactly what your life would be if you want to continue and if you stayed on the same destructive course that they had traveled. Look at verse 23. It says, make a chain for the land is filled with crimes of blood and the city is full of violence. The command to make a chain refers to the shackles and interleaking chain that would be put on the captives at that time. The land had filled up completely and overflowed with innocent blood, and now the holy God had and would respond with judgment. He would respond with judgment. Look at 24 and 25. It says, Therefore I will bring the worst of the Gentiles, and they will possess their houses. I will cause the pomp of the strong to cease. And their holy places shall be defiled. Destruction comes. They will seek peace, but there shall be none. Foreign enemies who would have no mercy on anyone would destroy everyone. Let me repeat that for you this morning. Foreign enemies who would have no mercy on anyone, would destroy everyone. Men, women, children. That's horrible. This was because the Jews had become so bloodthirsty in their sinful lifestyles that the holy living and real God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would bring the worst of the Gentiles against his people. They would possess the homes. They would defile the most sacred, holy temple and bring terrible violence to the land. No one would be safe. And as a last resort, the Jews would try to seek out a peace settlement. However, the peace at any price offer would be ignored. The enemy would not be hindered from satisfying their thirst for murder. Look at 26 and 27. It says disaster will come upon disaster and rumor will be upon rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. The king will mourn. The prince will be clothed with desolation and the hands of the common people will tremble. I will do to them according to their ways and according to what they deserve. I will judge them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. There was an endless chain of problems that was coming. Amen. There's an endless chain of problems coming. You're going to see suffering. You're going to see misery. You're going to see heartache. You're going to see unaliving. And, and these were the daily course of pains on those in Jerusalem. On top of all of that. On top of all of that. On top of all the suffering. All the misery. All the heartache. There would be the constant rumors of more things, worse things to come. They would have nowhere or no one to turn to. Their religious and civic leaders had no message of direction to give them. They would go to the prophets and the prophets would just shrug their shoulders, having no vision or word from God. The priest and the, the elders could not give any guidance or counsel to them. They had no solution. They had no direction. 
They had no wisdom coming anymore from God Almighty. God's voice had stopped. God's direction had stopped. God's wisdom had stopped. Look at Amos chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. It says, will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there is no trap for it? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it has caught nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Jeremiah 18, 18 reveals this as well. And it says, then they said, come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us attack him with the tongue. And let us not give heed to any of his words. You see, the, Lord, the leaders of both the government and religious areas would be equally bewildered. And have no explanation or message in which to encourage the people. See, they had been too involved in the abomination of idolatry. They had been too involved in denying and polluting the house of the magnificent and holy Yahweh. Look at verse 14 one more time. It says, moreover, all the leaders of the priest and the people transgress more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Here we see the final reason for what was to come on them. Here we see the final reason for what was to come on them. They had deserved it because of their particular path they had chosen and had been judged. They had not only just been judged, but they had been sentenced. And the penalty was now imposed on them. They had completely spurned the one who had loved them by seeking other lovers. They, they were seeking it through women. They were seeking it through their father's wives. They were seeking it through these idols. They were seeking it through earthly material things. They were placing idols before God. So now the judgment and the sentence and the penalty is now being applied. And they would know who they had done this to. You see, when we start to look at what's been done to Israel, we should really take heed as a people and a nation. We should take heed as a people and a nation. Do you really believe that God is going to let sin just go on and judgment not take place? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that a holy, sovereign God is just going to let sin run rampant and there's not going to be any judgment? I want you to think about this this morning after we read all of Ezekiel 7. When you see that they had placed things before God, what took place. But I really want you to think, what have you placed before God? What has this nation placed before God? Do you believe that the nation of the United States of America is going to be judged for what they're doing.